Good morning. In this lecture, I will uh, show you how to perform uh, analysis and characterization of second order phase transition by using the stochastic self consistent harmonic approximation method. In order to do that, let me first of all uh, summarize what we have seen in the previous lectures. So, here with H, I am indicating the Hamiltonian, uh, the exact Hamiltonian of the nuclei. So, K is the kinetic part of the Hamiltonian, and V of R is the potential energy of the ions where R is a collective variable uh, that describes the configuration of the ions, of the nuclei. So essentially V is the potential energy surface that you can compute, uh, for example, with, uh, by using any DFT code or, for example, uh, with the em empirical potentials. And here, rho is the exact density matrix uh, of the nuclei which is given by this uh, expression, where uh, beta is uh, the inverse temperature. And here we can see the free energy, the formula for the free energy. So we have the average uh, energy, so the energy, plus the entropy contribution to the free energy, so minus Ts. Now, in the self-consistent harmonic approximation method, essentially uh, we consider harmonic trial Hamiltonian. So here we have uh, the kinetic part of the Hamiltonian is the same, but we consider uh, trial quadratic potentials, which in general so depends on, uh, the, on two free parameters. One is this uh, uh, calligraphic R, which is a, which gives essentially the centroid, so the center of this trial quadratic potential, which corresponds to the average atomic configuration uh, of a system described by this uh, Hamiltonian, and phi here is the quadratic potential amplitude of this trial potential. And in particular, it's important to, uh, to stress that this phi is a, a positive definite matrix. So uh, this is a crucial point of the self-consistent harmonic approximation method. And by using this, uh, so considering this harmonic uh, trial Hamiltonian, we have the corresponding trial density matrix here, given by this formula. Now, in the, the self-consistent harmonic approximation, essentially, we replace in the formula for the free energy the density matrix with this trial, harmonic trial density matrix. And in this way, we define a free energy functional. This is a functional because it depends in general on two free parameters. This calligraphic R, so the centroid, and this phi. Okay. And then the self-consistent harmonic approximation is based on a variational principle. So by minimizing this functional with respect to the, the two free parameter R and phi, we obtain the estimate, the self-consistent harmonic approximation estimate of the free energy here. So when we minimize, in particular, when we minimize this functional, we have the corresponding value of these two parameters at the minimum. So calligraphic R minimum and phi minimum. Okay. So this is what we have at the end of our self-consistent harmonic approximation minimization. So we have the free energy estimate here, and also we have the values of uh, calligraphic R and phi at the minimum point of this uh, uh, functional, and so we have the corresponding 
harmonic uh, potential and so the harmonic Hamiltonian that we call so we call this Hamiltonian this quadratic Hamiltonian the self-consistent harmonic approximation effective harmonic Hamiltonian so in a sense this is the best harmonic Hamiltonian that we can use to approximate the exact Hamiltonian of our system so in general the system has a potential energy surface which can be any um, complicated function uh, strongly uh, with a strongly devi with strong deviation from uh, a quadratic potential well this quadratic potential here gives the best approximation according to the variational principle according to a pre-energy variational principle this is the best harmonic uh, potential that we can use to approximate the true potential energy surface but so now <clears throat> we have uh, two main questions what are the what is the physical meaning of these two pre parameter so calligraphic at the minimum and phi at the minimum so for the first uh, parameter uh, calligraphic r minimum the interpretation is quite simple this essentially is the uh, average, average configuration of the atoms at equilibrium so according to the within the uh, self-consistent harmonic approximation uh, we have that when we minimize the functional uh, we have we give first of all um, an estimation or what is the average uh, position of the atoms at equilibrium and this configuration is given by this calligraphic car minimum okay so this is uh, the first uh, physical quantity that we estimate so we estimate the free energy and we also have a, um, an estimate of the uh, average configuration of the atoms when we perform the stochastic the consistent harmonic approximation the sha minimization okay but the second uh, instead the second uh, quantity phi minimum uh, the to answer to this question what is the physical meaning of this quantity this is a a, a trickier question because in principle uh, we could think that uh, naively we could think that this uh, phi minimum is a sort of uh, generalization an harmonic generalization of uh, uh, of uh, the standard the harmonic force constant uh, matrix and in particular for example if we so if we divide this phi at the minimum which i have called simply with this phi here if we so if we divide this phi by the square root of the masses then we could think that this is uh, the harmonic generalization of uh, the standard dynamical matrix okay however this is not true this is not the correct interpretation of this quantity and there is a very simple reason if you, if you want why we cannot do that we cannot do that because as i have told you uh, by definition uh, this phi is positive definite because if it's not positive definite then the, the whole uh, structure of the minimization of the functional with respect to um, quadratic uh, Hamiltonian would not uh, work, work because uh, it's necessary that we consider um, positive definite uh, trial quadratic potential in order to have uh, not uh, ill-defined quantities. So the whole uh, SHA procedure is based on on the fact that these phi are positive definite but then if the phi is positive definite then for sure we when we end up in the minimum and we define this quantity then if we try to interpret this d of sha as an as an harmonic as a an harmonic generalization of the dynamical matrix we have the uh, paradoxal uh, the paradoxical uh, conclusion that we cannot never see a structural structural stability because this matrix is positive definite so we cannot see imaginary frequencies and so we cannot never see a form softening so we cannot never see a structural stability and of course 
we know that it, that is this cannot be true so this means that for sure this phi cannot be interpreted as a generalized uh, post constant matrix okay now so in order to so now it's clear that in order to uh, understand what is the physical meaning of this phi in a sense we have also to understand what is the the correct way to analyze uh, what happens when we have a, a structural instability in the system and in particular a second order uh, structural phase transition in the system because we know that uh, at least at harmonic level uh, we we say that uh, a system has a structural instability when we see a phonon softening in harmonic dynamical matrix now in this within this framework now where we are studying an anharmonic system what is the correct way to uh, detect when we have a structural instability and so as we have seen if we answer this question then we can also understand what is the meaning of this phi minimum because these two problems as we have seen are somehow related okay so in order to so the question now is how to study second order structural phase transition and in order to uh, tackle this problem first of all we have to define a fundamental quantity which is this uh, positional free energy so this is the free energy this quantity the positional free energy is the free energy as a function of the average atomic configuration so in a sense we are still considering the uh, the Sha free energy function but we are not minimizing the in general with respect to both the centroid r and phi but for each r we are minimizing only with respect to phi if you want you can think about this uh, procedure as uh, for example uh, the case that we are keeping the ions fixed in a configuration by applying an external field and then we want to know what is the free energy when we keep the ion uh, blocked in a certain configuration so this is the f of r okay this is the physical meaning of meaning of this f of r and but and of course uh, if we uh, leave the ions free to move then we obtain the free energy because the atoms then relax and go to this uh, uh, r of equilibrium so in a sense so which corresponds to to the to what happens when we minimize the function with respect to phi and r both okay so to summarize now we consider more in general this the free energy that depends on r so the free energy that depends on the average atomic configuration which is given by definition by minimizing the free energy function with respect only to phi okay now we will use this uh, quantity the position of free energy to describe what happens when we have a second order structural phase transition so in order to do that uh, we consider the standard uh, landau picture uh, to describe a second order uh, displacive uh, which means structural phase transition so a phase transition where we have the atoms that move okay so in this um, uh, plot here this figure here uh, we have on the horizontal axis the position uh, the configuration of the atoms uh, so this calligraphic card and uh, here zero corresponds corresponds to an asymmetry configuration okay and on the left we have the very on, on the um, vertical axis we have the uh, variation of uh, the difference of the free energy for a generic configuration with, re with respect to the free energy for this high symmetry configuration here now this curve so is the free energy uh, with respect to the position now what happens when we are uh, for example in a, in a high temperature let's let's uh, suppose that we have a system that at high temperature is is in the high symmetry configuration and uh, when the temperature goes below a certain uh, critical temperature we have phase transition and uh, the uh, the system goes through the from the high symmetry configuration to a lower symmetry configuration 
let's see from the within the Landau picture what happens okay so in this uh, so in the Landau picture we have that at high temperature so at temperature above the critical temperature so uh, when the system is in equilibrium in the high symmetry configuration we have that the free energy is something like that okay here I am just plotting a y-dimensional function uh, function so it's uh, a parabola here or in general of course is a parabolic uh, function with uh, the minimum that uh, in where the high symmetry configuration corresponds to the minimum of this uh, parabolic uh, quadratic function okay it's sort of, sort of paraboloid function okay. it's not uh, it's not a true parabola of course exact an exact parabola in principle then when we go down uh, with the temperature okay then uh, we have the at the critical temperature the instability appears so essentially this uh, the curvature of this uh, parabolic function uh, becomes uh, um, just lower and lower uh, it, it becomes flatter and flatter until at the TC <coughs> so at the critical temperature essentially we have a <coughs> that in the high symmetry configuration we have a solder point <coughs> and when the temperature goes below the critical temperature <coughs> we have that in the high symmetry configuration the free energy is not anymore a minimum but it becomes uh, a, um, a sort of a local maximum and so the at least it's saddle point so uh, there is at least a one direction along which the uh, the free energy goes lower uh, and so the system becomes unstable and moves along the direction in order to lower in order to lower the free energy so this is the typical uh, situation high temperature we have the uh, isometric configuration which is a minimum of the free and positional free energy curve then when we go lower um, decrease the temperature this uh, curvature becomes uh, as a value lower and lower until at uh, the critical temperature we have uh, essentially this becomes flat and then when the temperature goes below the critical temperature then the, the there is a, in the high symmetry configuration becomes from a minimum point becomes a subtle point and there is a, 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 at least a one direction along which the system can uh, displace the atoms uh, in order to uh, lower the free energy and so we have any stability this is the what happens in a second order dispersive phase transition at tc so from this uh, simple um, analysis we can uh, understand that the crucial uh, quantity that uh, is important in order to characterize a second order dispersive phase transition is the curvature in the high symmetry configuration at high temperature it's positive the curvature because uh, it's a minimum point then at a certain temperature uh, we have that the curvature becomes at least along one direction zero and then it becomes negative so uh, let me summarize once again so the crucial quantity is the second derivative of the free energy with respect to the centroid so the second or this the centroid which is the average position of the atoms okay evaluating in the high symmetry configuration at high uh, temperature this is a minimum that which means that the eigenvalues of this matrix are positive so this matrix is positive definite okay this is in general a matrix because uh, this capital uh, this uh, calligraphic car as i told you is a collective variable so uh, in general this is a vector a three times n vector where n is the number of atoms and 3 uh, comes from the Cartesian coordinate so at high temperature the 
second derivative of the free energy with respect to the centroid, so the free energy action in the isymmetry configuration is positive definitely. When the temperature is, uh, goes down, uh, in general, along at least one direction, uh, one of the eigenvalues of the free energy action uh, becomes um, smaller and smaller until at this end of the critical temperature we have uh, at least one eigenvalue that becomes zero. Okay? And if we go with the temperature below the critical temperature, then this eigenvalue then becomes uh, negative. Uh, eigenvalue becomes negative. So we have a softening. So the system displays so the, the structural stability in the system corresponds to a softening in the eigenvalue of the free energy action in the isymmetry configuration. Okay? And also, so the eigenvalue, the negative eigenvalue gives, let's say, the, by looking at what is the temperature at which one eigenvalue becomes zero and then negative, we can estimate the, cri the critical temperature. And looking at the corresponding, the corresponding eigenvector, we also find the, uh, the mode, the instability mode, the, the pattern along which moving the atoms, we have, uh, we can, uh, the atoms, uh, the, the displacement uh, along which the atoms move uh, in order to decrease the free energy. So we have the instability pattern uh, of the, the displacement pattern of the atoms. So therefore, this is what we have to do in order to have a proper generalization of the harmonic dynamical matrix. We have to replace the action of the potential energy surface with the action of the free energy with respect to the centroid. This is the correct generalization of the uh, harmonic dynamical matrix because in this way we can see by looking, by looking at the eigenvalue of this quantity, when there is a softening related to a instability, a structural instability. So this is the generalization. So we replace V in F, where F is uh, the energy minus temperature and times entropy. So First of all, so we replace the potential with the energy, and the, aver the energy is the average of the kinetic part and of the potential. It's the quantum average. So this way, we are, first of all, including uh, quantum effects in the nuclear dynamics. Because if, you, if we look just at the potential, this means that you are considering the nuclei as a classical particles. Whereas here, we are considering the full quantum nature of the nuclei, because we are considering the quantum energy. Okay, so it's included, for example, at zero-point energy. And also, we are not only considering the energy, but the free energy, the Helmholtz free energy in this case. So there is also the temperature with the entropy. So we are including the entropic contribution, and so thermal fluctuations are also taken into account. And of course, Thermal fluctuations are not included here. Okay, so by doing this generalization, we have included quantum, thermal, and anharmonic effect. So essentially, this is what you can do with Sharp. You compute the free energy action divided by the masses, so you have uh, the correct dimension. So this is our generalization of the harmonic dynamical matrix, and you compute this as a function of t. Uh, I have described so far a formalism in a supercell, real space supercell. Of course, we can uh, take advantage of the fact that we are considering a crystal. So we Fourier transform, and so in general we have also uh, we can uh, have something that depends on the positive momentum Q. And so by diagonalizing this, you obtain a form dispersion as a function of temperature, because you can diagonalize this for each temperature, and in this way you can characterize a second order phase transition because uh, you follow the, the, these phonons, these frequencies, the function of t, and when one of these frequencies becomes 
zero and then negative, you have found the estimate of the critical temperature. And by considering the corresponding eigenvector, you, have, you also have the corresponding displacement pattern. Of course, this not only works for the temperature in general, because instead of the Helmholtz free energy, you can consider the full Gibbs free energy, so also the pressure and the volume here. And so you can do exactly the same. So in this way, you obtain, you can diagonalize this object, and then you obtain frequencies that depends on the temperature, but also on the pressure. So, and then you can characterize, so a second order phase transition driven not only by the temperature, for example, but also by the pressure. This is what happens, for example, in the hydrides, in systems that we have, systems that we have studied a lot with this technique. Okay, <clears throat> sometimes in literature you can see a different kind of approach to study second order phase transition. Essentially, uh, what sometimes they do, they neglect the nuclei, they just compute the harmonic phonons uh, for different temperatures. And they include the temperature by changing the electronic smearing that they use to compute the phonons, okay? What does what this mean? Okay, this means that essentially you are discarding the quantum uh, uh, nature of the nuclei. You are still uh, considering nuclei as a classical particles. You are including temperature effect only on the electrons. So you are including the entropic contribution in the total free energy only coming from the electrons. You are not including the entropic contribution coming from the nuclei. And you know that in general, the entropic contribution from the nuclei is much bigger than the contribution entropic contribution from the electrons. That's why usually when they use this approach, they have uh, significant errors. And I will show you later an, an example of this. So in general, so this is not the correct way to analyze a second order uh, structural phase transition. Okay, <clears throat> so the object that you want, we need, so it's uh, the action of the free energy. In principle, in order to compute this quantity, we could just go by finite differences. So we could just displace the atoms, then compute the free energy by minimizing the functional, and then computing this by finite differences. Of course, this is very uh, complicated. Uh, it would require much uh, work to converge this object. But like, likely, uh, we have an analytic expression for uh, the Escher, which is this one. I will explain now to you what are the ingredients of this formula. And uh, the, core, the good thing is that essentially we don't, we don't need to move away from the high symmetry configuration to compute this object. So we don't need to, to compute the free energy in a different configuration and then make a, a finite difference derivative. We can do all the calculation uh, remaining in just the high symmetry configuration, which allows us to use symmetries and so do, to do calculation much faster. So what are the ingredients of this formula? This is the formula that is implemented in the code. Okay, this is just the self-consistent harmonic approximation matrix that we have seen uh, this uh, yesterday. So as Jörg showed yesterday, this is also equal to the average of the second order derivative of the potential. You remember, you can find this object or minimizing the functional or solving this self-consistent uh, relation. This is why it's called self-consistent harmonic approximation. See, the same object you have here and here. This is the density matrix of the corresponding Sha quadratic Hamiltonian. See, this is the average of an object which is defined this way, where this row is just the density matrix of the Sha Hamiltonian, which depends on this file. And same files here and here. So that's why it's called self consistent. What are these phi 3 and phi 4? Essentially, it's the same object, but now for the third order derivative and for the fourth order derivative. Okay? So it's a pretty simple the, the meaning of this object. Ah, so these are tensors, so this is a matrix, this is a third order tensor because you have a, an index here, an index here, and an index here, and this is a fourth order tensor, you have a four indices, okay? This is the meaning of these two dots, 
is a, let's say, a contraction, a scalar product, not with just one index, but with two indices. So you take two indices on the left here, and then you contract with this object lambda, uh, which is a fourth order tensor. I, I will show you now what is this object. So this is the meaning of these two products here. So what is this lambda? <coughs> Essentially, this lambda is a fourth order tensor, which is computed by just using the frequencies and the eigenmodes of the SHA dynamical matrix. So this is something that we already have at the end of the minimization. The explicit formula of this lambda is a bit uh, complicated, maybe. It's something like this. So it's fourth order tensor. See? These are just the eigenmodes, the eigenvector of the SHA dynamical matrix. And this function here depends on the frequencies and is given by this formula here. It's in, you can just uh, look at it on the paper. It's not important now. So, but the, the important thing is that we have uh, completely access to this object at the end of the sham minimization. Because at the end of the sham minimization, we have this object here. So we just need to analyze it to have frequency second vectors, and then we have this. Okay? So we have lambda, we have phi. We just need to compute, essentially, these two objects. Phi 3 and phi 3 and phi 4, okay? Now, in principle, you could think, okay, let's use a stochastic approach to compute uh, these two objects. But, of course, this is not really doable in this way because it would, it would, uh, it would need to compute the third-order derivative and fourth-order derivative of the potential from first principle for hundreds of configuration. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, I would say impossible, but it's, it would be very hard, okay? Uh, luckily, we can use the fact that this raw is a Gaussian, and so we can use a trick to use a stochastic approach to compute this quantity. So these are the definitions, okay? So the average is an integral of this object, and this is a raw, but the raw is a, uh, is a Gaussian, because it's a, quadratic, it's a density matrix of a quadratic potential. And so we can use uh, integration by parts. I don't show you the, the simple uh, passages, but es essentially, by using integration by parts, you can rewrite this average as the average of a, a simple function here, G3 and G4 I'm called here, which are simply linear function of, again, potential and forces. So essentially, you displace the atoms, you just collect, as you have done to compute the SHA, forces, total energy, with uh, a DFT code, for example, and then you compute the average of this uh, function, G3 and G4. I don't give you the analytic expression, but it's very simple. And so you can have access so very easily to these two objects. So this is essentially the workflow. You generate a population. Uh, in principle, you can use the same population that you have already used to minimize the function and reach the minimum. But sometimes you have to increase the population in order to improve the statistics, the statistics because usually in order to converge the calculation of these two objects, it requires uh, a bit more, uh, a, a population a bit larger than the one used to converge the second order derivative. But in any, in any case, the workflow is uh, the same. So you have population, then you compute total energy and forces, and then you compute by this average, simply by using a, a finite formula for the average. So this is the, the workflow to compute this object. So we have now everything. And so by using the, this formula here, that I showed before, this one, so we can compute the action. This is what uh, essentially uh, does the code. So the code to compute this uh, free energy action, this D of F, it also uses uh, lattice uh, translation symmetry to write this object in reciprocal space. So now where this R is an object that, that uh, describes the configuration of the atom in the supercell, now these are describe the configuration of the atoms in the unit cell modulated uh, like a wave according to this um, pseudo-momentum Q. Okay. 
this is the standard thing that you also do for electronic uh, stuff uh, for the block wave function. <coughs> now, at this level, uh, we have access to this object for the queue commensurate with the supercell that we have used to do the SHA. What I mean with this? For example, in order to do the SHA, you have used uh, a 2 by 2 by 2 supercell. Then, essentially, you have this object on a grid, on a Q grid, which is a, on a 2 by 2 by 2 grid in the brilliant zone. If you have used a 4 by 4 by 4 supercell to do the SHA minimization, you have this object for the Q belonging on the 4 by 4 by 4 grid in the brilliant zone. Okay? But we can use the fact that this object is uh, short-sighted. We can use Fourier interpolation. And so, in, in general, we can estimate this object for a generic Q, not just for the Q on the original grid. Essentially, <clears throat> this is the formula that uh, the code uses to do this uh, interpolation. Now, I, am, uh, I have just taken the, the, the formula for the free energy action. I have divided by the square root of the masses. That's why I have a D here. And uh, also now I'm uh, explicitly uh, using indices, okay? So these mu and v are just the indices by using uh, as a basis the, the mode basis of the Sha dynamical matrix, okay? So these are mu and, mu and u. So this uh, is uh, the first term of this formula here. Let me just go back. The, the first term here. Then I, I have the, the term with phi 3, lambda phi 3. Then I would have other terms with the phi 4. Uh, for the moment being, we have not implemented the, the free interpolation also for, for these other terms. Uh, we have discard, for the moment being, we discard this term here when we do this full interpolation. But in general, this is OK. Uh, we have seen so far uh, very often cases where uh, dealing with this uh, object here is not uh, necessary. Anyway, this is uh, uh, something that we are working on now in order to also implement uh, the free interpolation of this, ob this object here. <clears throat> so, by the way, this is the formula so for the free interpolation of this object. So, this is the Sha dynamical matrix, and since I'm using a Sha mode basis set, essentially this is a diagonal object. With the, the, on the diagonal, we have the square frequencies. So this is the, a, a grid where we are doing the interpolation. So essentially, you have to integrate on a, on a very fine grid in the brilliant zone until you reach the convergence. This is just a term that takes into account the momentum conservation. And this is just the D3 Fourier transform into this object, OK, here. In order to do this Fourier transform, you, so you go from the real space to the reciprocal space. In order to do that, you have to do, you have to do something, something that is called centering. Uh, it's a bit of technicality. I won't go into details uh, now about this. But it's something that you also do to do the full interpolation of the second order uh, dynamical matrix. Uh, it's a, some, something standard, let's say. So <clears throat> it's not important now. So by using this expression, so we start from the, this object defined on a grid, on a coarse grid of the brilliant zone, which is commensurate with the supercell. But now we have this for the Q belonging to any point, uh, on any point of the brilliant zone. And now, in this way, we can essentially plot the formal dispersion along a path, because otherwise we couldn't do that. And now, so we have access to this along any path in the brilliant zone. So now we can essentially plot a formal dispersion, a generalized formal dispersion, as a function of the temperature and pressure, and so estimate the uh, characterize a second order phase transition by looking at the point in the, the, at the temperature or pressure and the, the point in the brilliant zone where the dispersion becomes imaginary. Okay, I will show you some examples. Now, how much time? Uh, I'm done. Okay, <clears throat> so I show you some example uh, where uh, we applied this uh, technique, so you can uh, see more, more practically what, what does it mean, what I have uh, explained so far. So, for example, we studied uh, with this technique uh, what happens uh, in the um, 
the regarding the charge density wave instability for the decalcogenite, okay? Because for the decalcogenites, which are systems which are easily exfoliated, and so you can go from the bulk to the monolayer limit, there is always, uh, let's say, there was a, um, a big, uh, let's say, uh, a controversial about the role played by the lower dimensionality when you consider the structural instability. Because in principle, you have two competing effects. On the one side, uh, when you have uh, you consider a monolayer, we have a stronger fluctuation, and so this uh, disfavor a, a long order uh, reconstruction, so a child density wave. But on the other side, when you have uh, when you consider a monolayer, you have a reduced screening, and so uh, you have a stronger electron phonon coupling, and so this favor a long range order. So in a sense, you have two competing effects, and uh, generally you cannot say what happens when you go from the bulk to the monolayer. And here, for example, there are cases of uh, four uh, uh, decalcogenites, and when you go from the child density way from the monolayer, from the bulk to the monolayer, you can see sometimes nothing happens. Sometimes, for example, you have a child density way instability in the bulk, but when you go to the monolayer, it disappears. And for these two systems, uh, the experimental signature was not clear. So we use the SHA to analyze what happens in these cases. For example, this is an iobium disulfide, and uh, we studied uh, this system uh, in the bulk, which is this, and in the monolayer case by using the SHA. So this is uh, a case uh, where at zero temperature, for example, in the bulk, we see that the system is stable. So even with, when you go to a very low temperature, the system remains stable. But when you go to the monolayer limit, the system becomes unstable. And there is a, a reconstruction which corresponds to a 3 by 3 supercell. So what are these lines? These are the phonon dispersion computed with the SHA, including an quantum and harmonic effect. In this case, at zero temperature. So, as you see, no charge density instability in the bulk, but yes, in the monolayer. For example, in the bulk, this is what you see when you compute, for example, the phonon dispersion in the harmonic approximation. This is uh, the phonon dispersion that you see. So, at harmonic level, the system is unstable. Uh, but from a, an experiment, they don't see any instability. And this is confirmed by our calculation. So as you can see, we have, we have here two different phonon dispersion, one for 300 K, K Kelvin and uh, one for uh, 2 Kelvin. This is the X-ray experiment. And we, do, we did the same uh, analogous calculation with the SHA. Okay? Of course, if you want to do something like that uh, with the harmonic approximation, you cannot do that. Or you can try to do that by resorting to the electronic temperature. But at, at electronic level, for example, you don't see anything if you go from, from 300 Kelvin to 2 Kelvin. Uh, the electronic uh, uh, effects, so when you increase the temperature, are, uh, you can see uh, an effect when you increase the temperature much uh, higher than that. So, and, and as you can see, the agreement between the SHA and the experiment, this is the result of the experiment with these uh, points here, as you can see, it's very good, and uh, there is a clear uh, temperature dependence of the, the phonon dispersion. And also, we, here I show you what happens when you consider the monolayer. Again, if you consider at harmonic level, the system is uh, simply unstable, again, but at uh, harmonic level. But if you use uh, an harmonic uh, SHA calculation at zero Kelvin, as you can see, uh, oops, you can have it. the system goes from being unstable to being stable just with a very slight uh, uh, compression absorption of the crystal. This means, that, for example, that this uh, system is very sensitive to the substrate. And this, uh, for example, is an, expl an explanation of why an experiment sometimes uh, some group saw instability, some other group didn't see any stability. They were using different substrate. And this, so the motivation 
that uh, we gave is that probably there was also contribu a contribution from the uh, tensile effect coming from the substrate that uh, made this uh, Chadez wave appearing or disappearing. Also, this difference in energy is so small that, of course, it's clear that quantum effects are relevant. So it's important to use the SHA, because the SHA, as I told you, included quantum effects in the nuclear dynamics, which is something that is totally absent if you use uh, harmonic approximation of classical, uh, or classical uh, molecular dynamics. So that's why this effect is uh, very, uh, it's a very quantum effect, and so it's essential to use something that includes the quantum nature of the nuclei. This is another kind of calculation, uh, similar calculation that we did for another system, niobium diselenide. Okay. <clears throat> this is the phonon dispersion as a function of temperature uh, for the bulk. Okay. <clears throat> Again, there is uh, here a comparison with experiment and theory. So these are the this is the phonon dispersion that we obtain with SHA for different temperatures. And here with this uh, box here, we have the experimental values. So, as you can see, with the SHA, we are able to see uh, a child density wave instability at a certain temperature between uh, uh, 50 and 100 here. Actually, if you do uh, the same kind of calculation, right, why am I now showing you this example? Because, uh, for example, the same system was studied by another group um, by using the electronic temperature as uh, a factor to describe this phase transition. Now I will show you that if you use electronic temperature, you totally miss the correct uh, behavior of the system in terms of temperature. So this is what you obtain if you use uh, as a temperature just the electronic temperature. So you compute the harmonic uh, uh, phonons, but just using different uh, temperature in the Fermi Dirac smearing for the DFT calculation. So this is what you obtain. You consider the harmonic dynamical matrix, you diagonalize it, and you have this plot. So you see an instability, but you see an instability around uh, here, you see uh, this temperature, uh, almost 900 Kelvin, whereas the experimental one is around 30, okay? As I told you, when you do this kind of calculation, you are neglecting the entropic contribution from the nuclei. So let's see what happens when you do the, calcu the, the calculation by using the SHA. And this is what you obtain when uh, you use SHA. The line is uh, much closer to the experimental one, this is so, as you see. So you go from almost 900 Kelvin to 660 uh, Kelvin, which is uh, much closer to the experiment. So as you can see, it's fundamental to use the entropic contribution from the nuclei if you want to describe a displacive, a second order, a child density wave, for example, second order phase transition. We did the same calculation also for the monolayer, and actually uh, we saw that uh, instability also modulated uh, along a 3 by 3 supercell. Here it was in the 3 by 3 by 1 supercell. And uh, essentially we saw a very similar uh, behavior for the bulk in the monolayer in this case, and this was confirmed uh, by experiments. So you see the, see the critical temperature for the bulk and the monolayer is, uh, is very similar. So uh, this case for the chart density transition for niobium diselenide, we saw that the ionic fluctuation dominate over electronic uh, fluctuation and there, is, there was a weak dimensionality dependence. Of course, if you don't use uh, the SHA and use just harmonic calculation, you cannot see this effect. So I have to show you an example of uh, a second order phase transition driven by the temperature. And uh, now, as I told you, you can also consider uh, you can also consider the pressure. So let's see an example of uh, a second order phase transition, a structural phase transition driven by the pressure. So this is, uh, for example, a typical case of these uh, hydrides, which are uh, in this class of uh, superconductors, high temperature superconductor. Here, lanthanum H10 and H3S. <clears throat> these are uh, superconductors uh, with the critical temperature very high, and uh, which have, but 
when they show this uh, superconducting behavior, they are in these uh, high symmetry phases. This one, this for H3S, and this for lanthanum H10 at very high pressure. Since uh, in this system we have a lot of uh, protons, uh, and protons are light in general, this system quantum effects are uh, very important because protons are uh, really uh, quantum particles. You cannot just uh, discard quantum effect. And, and therefore, using uh, SHA to describe the system is a uh, uh, very, uh, very good case. So, for example, what happened with lanthanum H10? If you consider, <coughs> so here I'm uh, showing you the phonon dispersion computed or with the harmonic approximation or with the SHA, for different pressure. So as you can see, uh, you have to increase a lot the pressure in order to make the system stable at harmonic level. So you see here, the harmonic frequencies are imaginary, 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 and they start and become, the system becomes stable around this pressure here. So much higher than the pressure when the system is seen in experiment. Whereas the SHA show the correct behavior. You see the phone dispersion here it's stable. So uh, the quantum fluctuation of the protons stabilize the system at a much lower pressure than what you see if you consider just the classical nature of the nuclei. If you describe the nuclei just as a classical level. Another case is uh, uh, H3S, for example. Okay, this is uh, the pressure at which the system is seen uh, uh, in the superconducting phase in this uh, high symmetry configuration, IM minus 3M. So as you see, this is the phonon dispersion thermonic level, and the system is strongly unstable, whereas in experiment is seen to be stable in this phase when you consider this pressure. Okay? So this is what happens when you consider uh, this uh, this is the, the phonon that is related to a, a distortion from the high symmetry configuration here to the R minus 3M uh, configuration. So it's a rhomboidral distortion. And this distortion is driven by this, uh, by this pattern here described by this phonon. Okay? So if you consider the harmonic approximation, you diagonalize uh, the harmonic matrix and you follow this uh, frequency as a function of pressure, this is what you see. In order the system to become stable, you have to go up to 170 gigapascal, okay? But below this pressure, the system is unstable. And this is against what you see in experiment. But if you use SHA, this is what you obtain. So you have here the phonon dispersion in blue, uh, computed by SHA, and by following this uh, frequency, the function of pressure, as you see, and the system is still stable until this pressure is reached. So this is compatible again with experiment. <clears throat> Something that is uh, that I want to uh, stress here, as you can see here, there, there are these blue stripes. What are these blue stripes? So these are uh, the phonons uh, computed, let's say, with uh, the, the Hessian of the free energy. And what, the, what are these uh, stripes? This is, these are the line width. So essentially, when you have uh, a photon, uh, sorry, a phonon, in general, this is not uh, a non-interacting particle. The phonon are interacting particles, so they scatter each other. And so at certain point, uh, you lose this uh, particle, so they have a lifetime. And as you can see, as, as you know, uh, in uncertainty in the time uh, corresponds uncertainty, uncertainty in the energy. So that, that's why you have uh, an uncertainty in energy regarding phonons. Now, what we have seen so far doesn't uh, show you how to compute this object, okay? Because what, what, we have, what we have done so far is just taking an, uh, a matrix and then analyzing it, and so we have just the lines, just the phonon frequencies. So where this line width comes from? This will be the, say, okay, this, uh, this is what I was saying before. So what we have uh, what we have seen here, the line width, is something that we cannot uh, explain so far because what we have seen now is just a static theory. We have 
a second derivative of the free energy, we are then analyzing it, but we have just phonon with infinite lifetime. There is no line width, there is no uh, phonon dumping. So in order to uh, compute this quantity here, the line width, we need to go beyond a static theory. So we need to introduce a dynamical theory of the Sha phonons. And this will be the object of the next lecture. And, uh, Okay. Ah, yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, if you have a question, then uh, <laughs> I, I talk to you.